Welcome everyone, Dr. Mandel here. I am here at South Beach Detox with Dr. Sanchez. He will be our specialist today. We will be discussing important information for those who are taking medication for their pain, those who are suffering in pain, those who have anxiety, stress, or even depression. If you're new to this channel, hit that subscribe button below and hit that bell so you can get future notifications for videos that will help you and your family. So welcome Dr. Sanchez for being here with us. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sanchez is a forensic psychologist. Uh, I first wanna mention and discuss pain. The majority of our subscribers, people who tune into this channel have different kinds of pain from neck to back to joint or other systemic pain problems. Uh, I want you just to maybe comment on that and give our audience a little bit of information on ways that we can advise them in a professional way, not diagnosing their condition, but to give them some alternative things that they can do, or maybe why they're having these potential problems, because pain is not only physical. Uh, there is a psychological component to that. Maybe you can discuss that. Sure. So there's a lot of research to indicate that uh, the pain centers and the pleasure centers in the brain um, have dysregulation uh, with neurochemistry associated with uh, dopamine receptors, acetylcholine receptors, et cetera. And so one of the things that, that manifests often with people who have major depression, uh, generalized anxiety disorders, and other trauma conditions is that a lot of times some of their psychological difficulties manifest uh, in physical pain. So that is something that uh, it should be assessed with their provider, their primary care provider, and or psychologist or therapist if they're under uh, the care of, of a therapist or psychologist. Uh, people who are on painkillers uh, or any kind of medication that can help them with their pain because people be anti-inflammatories, maybe muscle relaxers, or we're looking more of the involved drugs that maybe you could mention. Uh, a lot of these medicines, uh, which I'm not going to mention, can be very quite addictive. That's correct. Uh, from this addictiveness that they're, that they're getting or that they can't get off these drugs, uh, generally, uh, is it common that their body becomes immune to the strength of what they're taking and eventually that they have to take more? Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, that's working more from a, a symptomatic point of view rather than the causation. And where, where can this lead to? Where does this go to? So one of the things that happens uh, with neurochemistry is that uh, when somebody begins to take any type of medication, but specifically uh, opiates and, and, and pain relievers of this kind, is that the body will, will develop a tolerance. So they need to increase the amount of medication that they take in order to alleviate some of the symptoms. Uh, the problem with this is that over time it can become, uh, the body can become accustomed to it and the person can become addicted. This also goes for over-the-counter medications. Absolutely. There are a number of over-the-counter medications that are uh, being abused at this time uh, associated with uh, 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 pain management. Sometimes inappropriately and not diagnosed by a doctor, but other times something that is prescribed and the body creates tolerance of the patient or the individual begins to take more and more of the medication to alleviate their symptoms. Uh, the, the, the issue that I have uh, with uh, the many of subscribers and, and the emails that I get, uh, from what I read that when people go to doctors, and we're talking, you know, medical doctors, mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me they're always complaining that they're walking out with some script. Mm -hmm. uh, where do we draw that fine line? You know, because uh, a doctor's job is to get them to feel better. Sure. But I, I like to really find that underlying causation of, of what these people can be doing. Sure. At, at least the majority of them, mm -hmm. so they don't have to get into that zone. Certainly. So, so one of the things that uh, I have seen patients do is if they have a history of addiction already or, or even a predisposition to having it, if it runs in the family uh, or there have been others uh, uh, genet and they're genetically predisposed to have issues with addiction, it's, it's important that they, re you know, they reveal that to their primary care physicians. 
I also think that you know sometimes getting second opinions uh, is key. Absolutely, in, yeah. In talking to uh, physicians about uh, the course and types of medications that are prescribed for what period of time and for what conditions, there are a variety of medications uh, that are usually available for for uh, uh, certain types of cases, and I think that. Um, if uh, an individual feels that they're walking out with too many scripts to handle too many symptoms, they should seek a second opinion. Uh, very important. Uh, briefly, just commonly, because uh, most people have access over the counter, and uh, the two most common types of medicines that, that are your non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, uh, or you look at acetaminophen. Acetaminophen obviously uh, can do uh, lots of uh, damage to the liver, as well as the uh, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Uh, your ibuprofens and your uh, naproxens and stuff like that to the kidney. Uh, the long-term effect of damage that people have no idea uh, is helping them with their pain, but I'm concerned about their health. Sure. And I'm sure they're concerned about them health, their health. And unfortunately, we don't want to have failure of an organ where it's too late. How, are we, how do we explain that uh, where we can't diagnose them over the, the internet, uh, but it's, it's serious. It's, it's pretty serious. It's, I mean, you look at all the cases worldwide, there's a lot of people who, a lot of deaths out there. A lot of kidney uh, people end up on dialysis. Sure. Uh, and that's a serious problem. And obviously, my, I, I'm gathering that from your uh, professional background, and you see people uh, using the heavy drugs, that's what you deal with in this mm -hmm. detox facility sure. all day long, and they come from all around the country here. Mm -hmm. Many of these have start out, started out on those over-the-counter medications. That's true. So that's something I'm very concerned about. So I think that um, talking to one's provider and getting educated about not continuing to take over-the-counter medications for chronic pain making sure that you're seeing specialists and getting second opinions and understanding that over-the-counter medications are for short-term use only uh, is something uh, that, that uh, the general public should be made more aware of. Uh, I think it's important for the primary care physician uh, to explain these things to individuals that taking acetaminophen for three weeks every day, for example, uh, you know, may have some, as you're alluding to, some negative effects on some of the organs. And that if somebody is uh, experiencing pain for that long, a lot of the over-the-counter medications do have negative effects, like some of the prescription medications. I think it's a matter of being responsible and seeking out the proper specialists and second opinions when warranted to treat said conditions. So this pain has a, a direct relationship with uh, anxiety, sure. uh, depression, sure. stress. Sure. Stress kicks up uh, catecholamines, it affects the central nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, sympathetic, fight or flight. And uh, we get that surge of cortisol and epinephrine and it uh, starts leading to other conditions like, you know, you may get sweaty palms, lightheadedness, increased blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Uh, digestive problems, difficulty sleeping are common ones. Uh, uh, this is not, quote, the drug that they're taking, but the effect of what they're getting. Sure. And this is a very serious problem. Sure. Uh, where does this lead to? Because I'm a believer that uh, I've always uh, come from the old school that uh, it's the stress levels that sometimes injure and hurt us or destruct us quicker than the drugs. Certainly. Uh, so let's go into that end a little bit of anxiety. Uh, anxiety is a serious condition. Anxiety uh, can lead to many other psychological issues as well as depression. I guess they go hand in hand. Sure. Uh, and then anxiety is directly related with panic attacks. Sure. Uh, and that's, uh, and depression. Mm -hmm. I guess they're all kind of sit in one category. Sure. Uh, person is having pain. Take a simple example, uh, they're all panicky right now. The anxiety gets worse, their stress levels go up, it starts affecting them day to day, we start losing sleep. So a person's having pain, they experience anxiety, difficulty concentrating, focusing, uh, it's overwhelming their life. Uh, these people don't wanna even get out of their house, they don't wanna talk to people, you know. Uh, it, it has so many different symptoms. One condition can lead to so many problems. Then they start developing insomnia, difficulty sleeping. Mm -hmm. uh, that in itself causes physical problems where those cells are not repairing and turning over. 
It affects the brain, where hormones and chemicals, neural chemicals within the brain is being affected. What kind of advice can we give these people? This is so common. Mm -hmm. This is, when I say common, everyone who has pain has some degree of one of these problems. Sure. And how can they conquer this? Mm -hmm. So there's a number of things that can be done. One is talk therapy. Two specific uh, modalities are proven to work in, in a lot of empirical data over the last 20 years. One is cognitive behavioral therapy, and the other one is called systematic desensitization, where people are taught breathing techniques. Uh, they're taught to relax in certain situations. And so that those things can be very effective. There's a couple of other things that people probably don't talk about very often, and one is just a balanced diet. A lot of people who suffer anxiety skip meals and end up eating once a day or maybe even less than that. And so that then, as you were discussing, sort of uh, catapults and, and, and makes the problem much worse. The other affair is that oftentimes they don't sleep well and there's a number of things that they can do to aid and assist in sleep. Uh, 30 minutes of exercise to 45 minutes a day, four to five days a week often helps. Um, if there's you know more a little bit more advanced, there are other formularies for getting enough exercise to make sure that their sleep regulation and appetite regulation is kept in check. I want to say a few things. Uh, meditation extremely important. Yoga is excellent. Deep breathing exercises, increasing the parasympathetic nervous system, lowering cortisol levels. Uh, extremely important. I have many videos out there for our new listeners or even subscribers, check out my other videos on uh, meditative breathing. Uh, I have excellent videos that can help you on that. Also, we talk about, about anxiety, very important diet, uh, Dr. Sanchez mentioned, excessive sugar. Sugar is a, is, is a serious stimulant, uh, an anti it's a, I'm sorry, it's an inflammatory stimulant. Cutting down on sugars can do a remarkable amount of healing when it comes to people with anxiety. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the, you, you hear many of these diets out there, low sugar, and, but this is not so much of a diet, it's, it's a way of eating. And I really can't stress to omit or get rid of those refined processed sugars. And again, it's very important to make sure that you're looking at your glycemic index, to lower the glycemic, glycemic index so your food, you can go to YouTube or uh, anywhere on Google, type in glycemic index foods, eat those foods that are lower glycemic index, those are the ones you'll notice that will have most of the fiber in the whole state. How are, how are people getting these drugs? Where does it lead to? Is it easy to get off of them? That's your specialty. So when we talk about opioids, you know, opioids are just painkillers and we have specific receptors in the brain that are designed to uh, provide natural painkillers in the instance of pain in our bodies. But, but sometimes when the threshold uh, past a certain uh, levels, we need to introduce outside painkillers uh, to aid and assist with patient pain. And, and this is a, a very old tradition that goes back to uh, Western medicine uh, with poppy seeds uh, and using some of the natural opioids, which is where they, they really came from. Um, they're very effective at dealing with pain. The problem has become that there's been an over-prescribing of some of those medications that started in the 1990s different types of medications such as codeine, uh, fentanyl, carfentanyl, uh, and, and what began to happen was they were being overprescribed, you know, with, with well-intentioned folks to just aid and assist with patient pain. The problem is that they are highly addictive. So people that don't even have predispositions to become addicted to these medications often do because of the nature of, of the way it binds in the brain and because of the need for the increased dosages to receive the same effect. Listen, if somebody needs uh, to seek treatment uh, when they find themselves in these positions, it's imperative that they do so. Absolutely. Uh, simply yeah. because yeah. The, the detoxification off of opiates is so painful that it is often very unsuccessful when someone tries to do this on, the, their own. on their own. Exactly. So seeking professional help is, is key. A very important topic is weight gain. Mm -hmm. Weight gain leads to depression and other ailments, physical ailments, cardiovascular problems, mm -hmm. insulin resistance, uh, type 2 diabetes, mm -hmm. cancer. This is a, a very serious issue and, and those that are just trying to do the quick diet to lose the weight without getting to the underlying root of that condition, which may be their pain. Mm -hmm. It's all tied into each other. Sure. It becomes a, a, a neurophysical component now. Uh, overeating, mm -hmm. 
uh, indulging in, in excessive food, binge eating. So certainly we know that there's a lot of comorbidity uh, when you have addictive type disorders, both with uh, drugs and alcohol, eating disorders, and other type of addiction disorders. Um, when, when those things arise, one of the you know one of the best things somebody can do is again seek proper medical attention, but paying close attention to the level of exercise and diet. Th those are the two most fundamental things when it comes to obesity that an individual can do outside of the professional arena, uh, which is to make sure that they're getting enough physical activity. Many research uh, uh, articles and peer-reviewed journal articles indicate that most uh, people in the United States are not getting enough physical activity. The other thing we know is that th what they're taking in, in in the way of diet uh, often leads to the conditions, as you alluded to er earlier, with uh, sugar intake and sodas. So. These are things that people really should pay more attention to because ultimately if it leads to exogenous obesity, it ties into the pain threshold, it ties into addiction uh, types, type of disorders, and, and these things often become a bigger problem. So this addictive behavior, which is quite common worldwide, mm -hmm. has an effect on these other effects that we're discussing right now. Mm -hmm. And getting to that root, like you say, diet, I think is extremely important because uh, everyone's trying to sell their fast diet. It be has to become a way of eating, a way of, a it's a behavioral thing. It all goes back to the brain. Everything is, you know, doing things the right way. I I I'm totally against diets. Because when you diet, it becomes something that's temporary. Mm -hmm. uh, when you start doing something as part of your life, as a change, as a permanent change, and how many days is it when you break habits? 21 days or, you know, they, they have different things for different conditions. But I guess over several weeks, your, your body starts to adjust. It's like getting off sugar. That's correct. Is getting off sugar similar to maybe getting off an addictive drug? I mean, theoretically, I mean, I'm not trying to compare apples and oranges. Sure. But it is a stimulant. It is a drug. Mm -hmm. And basically, it's getting off it. I mean, in your situation right here, as I sit up here and I... I walked around your huge, beautiful facility, and uh, it's beautiful, and uh, patients I see walking by me, and they're detoxing right now. They're getting off something to allow that brain chemistry that those serotonin, uh, the dopamine receptors, and all those neuro brain chemicals uh, are changing right now. Mm -hmm. It's no different than diet. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you that temporary diets are not going to be as effective as proper nutrition. And so I think it's important for people to get educated about what they're yeah. eating and make the nutritional changes that they need to make over time. I also believe um, that being patient with themselves in relation to uh, successive approximations in, in the way of goals uh, to weight gain, uh, to weight loss, uh, as well as implementing exercise. I, I can't yeah. emphasize that enough. That if they're medically cleared, and you know, exercise and how much a person moves throughout the course of a day. Is Absolutely, key. they may not be running a, a marathon, but like you say, getting up, walking up the stairs, doing Absolutely. things, making those changes. Absolutely. Uh, we talk about sleep deprivation. That has such an effect on weight loss because. It does. When you don't sleep, the articles and the journals will tell you that people become more binge eaters, they eat more junk food, they mm -hmm. become more hungry, mm -hmm. it affects your whole neurochemistry. Absolutely. So getting proper sleep is so important. We know that all the things we're talking about can lead to depression. Sure. Depression goes back to the neurochemicals of the brain. By all means, something serious that you don't want to ignore right. because that can lead to other serious problems which you don't, we don't even want to talk about. Right briefly talk about depression now because uh, pain depression obesity depression anxiety depression sleep deprivation depression everything seems to be the 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 direct relationship with depression mm -hmm. it seems like everything's pointing at depression right depression uh affects our own self-esteem sure. affects our family, our friends. So I think that one of the things that happens is many people take the feeling of sadness and think that that's what depression is, or they'll say, I feel depressed. But what they don't understand is that there's, you know, there's a, a, a diagnostic uh, category system that we use to determine whether somebody is in fact depressed. If they are in fact depressed, then yes, 
of course, there's high comorbidity with depression and sleep deprivation, with anxiety, with substance abuse. So we know that oftentimes, as you alluded to earlier, dealing with some of the core issues that are causing the depression can aid and assist to alleviate and or entirely um, uh, entirely route out some of the other problems if it's dealt with early. But like most diseases, the earlier that we catch it and the sooner that we intervene upon it, uh, the better the outcomes. But does, uh, we, look, we look at diseases, uh, depression is considered a disease. It is. It's a, it, so it's categorized in the American Medical Association yes. as well as the American Psychiatric Association and in the DSM-5, which is the Bible for Psychiatric Disorders. And it is, in fact, a central nervous system disorder. Right. Interesting. So I want to thank you, Dr. Sanchez, uh, for allowing me to come here and discuss this great information for my audience, my subscribers. And I really hope that uh, you continue to pursue that mission, helping those people worldwide who are having those great difficulties. I'm going to put your information in the description below if anyone has any questions. I want to thank you, the audience, for tuning in with us. And I ask everyone out there to make it a great day. I'm Dr. Alan Mandel.